morning, everyone. Welcome to the March meeting of the Board of Regents. Before I ask Jess to call the roll, I'll start off with my usual reminders to help our meeting go smoothly. First, I encourage everybody who is joining by, by phone or video conference to mute your microphones while others are speaking to help us cut down on any extra background noise. I'm also going to ask chancellors and staff from the system administration and the campuses to turn off your video cameras unless you would like to speak or need to present an item. If after turning on your video, you want to be acknowledged to engage in the discussion, simply raise your hand. For those of you wearing masks, please remember to speak into your microphones loudly and clearly so everybody can hear you. And finally, remember to identify yourself when making comments or asking questions. And with that, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Regent President Peterson. Here. Vice President Greeby. Here. Regent Atwell. Here. Regent Bechtel? Here. Regent Bogus? Here. Regent Cologne? Here. Regent Hall? Here. Regent Jones? Here. Regent Klein? Here. Regent Lovezo? Regent Many Deeds? Here. Regent Miller. Here. Regent Peterson. Here. Regent Saffold. Regent Stanford Taylor. Here. Regent Walsh. Here. Regent Weatherly. Here. Regent Woodmansey. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Before we consider items on today's agenda, are there board members who wish to declare any conflicts of interest regarding today's open session agenda? Seeing none, let's go ahead and proceed. Before we get started with today's agenda, it's my pleasure to introduce our newest member of the board, John W. Miller. John is the founding and founder and principal at Aaron Holdings, Ehrenberg Holdings, a venture capital fund established in 2015 to make investments in early stage companies with an emphasis on companies located in the Midwest. John began his career as a congressional staffer, serving as the chief tax and budget policy advisor for a Wisconsin congressman, serving on the House Ways and Means Committee, as well as the Committee on the Budget. In 2006, John joined Miller St. Nazian's his family's farm equipment manufacturing business and became the fifth generation of his family to lead the company as president and CEO. In late 2014, he sold the company to CNH Industrial, its largest customer. John serves on many local charitable boards, including the Discovery World, the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin Foundation, Bubbler Bikes, the Wisconsin Policy Forum, and the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation's Entrepreneurship and Innovation Committee. John earned his bachelor's degree at Marquette University, a master's degree at Georgetown University, and a law degree from the University of Wisconsin Law School. Since our last meeting, I've enjoyed getting to know John, albeit briefly, and we all look forward to working with you in the future. Welcome aboard, John. Would you like, you like to say a few words? Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I uh, just want to say it's an honor to be here at my first meeting. And I want to thank everybody who's been so gracious and welcoming and taking the time to uh, answer my, fel uh, my questions. Uh, and I'm looking forward to getting to know my, my uh, fellow regents um, and getting up to speed and participating. So thank you very much. Thank you, John, and welcome. The record of the February 4th and 5th, 2021 Board of Regents meeting has been provided. May I have a motion to approve the record? So moved, Madam Jones. Second, Olivia. Thank you, Regent Jones and Regent Woodmansey. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same aye. sign. The records carry. First, a brief update on the search for a new chancellor at UW River Falls. In January, the search committee approved the position prospectus and officially opened the search. The deadline for full consideration of applications is next week on March 12th. 
The Search and Screen Committee, chaired by Regent Scott Bechtel, is expected to reconvene later this month to select semifinalist candidates and hold on off-campus interviews. Now I'd like to say a few words about our capital biennial budget request, which Governor Evers addressed in announcing his budget. More than half of the University of Wisconsin system's buildings were built in the 1950s and the 1970s. And many now require significant repair and renovation work to ensure continued safety, as well as to support continued excellence in teaching, learning, and research on our UW campuses. Last August, this board approved the UW system's request for $1.3 billion in capital budget authority. 83% of this would go towards either renovation or replacement. Let me say that again. 83% of this would go towards either renovation or replacement. Simply put, we need to address the long-standing repair and maintenance backlog in our aging facilities while also prioritizing construction to meet growing market demands in fields such as STEM and healthcare. We got a good start and made strong progress on this in the last budget and the capital request before the legislature and the governor now will continue with that work. Our request emphasizes affordability. Our proposed new construction projects are only for obsolete buildings where renovation is neither cost effective nor educationally appropriate. Public safety and health are also concerns addressed in our request. In several cases, the new buildings proposed would actually have a much smaller footprint than the building they're replacing in order to achieve project efficiencies. Our request for state funding is strategic and focuses on STEM facilities to provide modern, up-to-date facilities that support workforce needs while also helping to attract and retain our students and faculty. Today, nearly 40% of all degrees awarded by the UW system are in STEM or healthcare related fields. In fact, the, gra the growth of our graduates in STEM has increased by 40% in the last 10 years alone. Our capital request reflects that demand. Some might ask why would the UW system need more than 1 billion in building projects at a time when so many employees are working from home and students are studying online. I would respond that the pandemic has made one thing very clear. Demand for a residential UW college experience is strong. Even while we expanded online class delivery because of our COVID concerns, our enrollment numbers around the UW system campuses have remained remarkably steady over the past year. Student enthusiasm is strong. In the newspaper just yesterday, for example, it was reported that UW-Madison has received a record 53,800 freshman applications this year, with increases among in-state, domestic, and international students. That's a whopping 17% jump from last year. And although online instruction accounted for as much as 20% of the UW's often offerings even before the pandemic, our experiences of the last year have reinforced the belief that collaboration and in-person contact are key to learning and growth, and that means we need the proper facilities. I should point out that our capital budget request includes more than $200 million to complete projects that are already underway, including three projects that are in second phase renovations, CLO at UW Oshkosh and the Northwest Quad and Sandberg Hall West Tower both at UW-Milwaukee, and one in, that is in the second phase of replacement of a building. The Prairie Springs Science Center at UW-La Crosse completes the development of a new science building to replace Cowley Hall. The governor's budget now goes before the legislature. We know that there will be a re robust debate about the budget, but we trust that the governor and our legislators understand that a significant investment in higher education helps advance our shared priorities of growing Wisconsin's talent pipeline, improving lives, and providing opportunities for families to earn higher wages. We are pleased to report that our budget proposal has received very positive response to date from legislators. We look forward to working with the governor, legislators, our stakeholders in the private and public sectors, our faculty, our staff, and our students to advance our shared priorities. And with that, that concludes my report. President Thompson, I'll now turn the floor over to you. <clears throat> Good morning, 
everybody at Board of Regents and uh, John Miller, welcome aboard. I'm I'm sure you're related to, uh, must have been your uncle that was the Attorney General under John Reynolds. Is that? Uh, that, that was my grandfather, Victor. Grandfather, I, I remember him very well. I, I go so back that I remember your grandfather being Attorney General. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, welcome aboard and uh, good luck to you. Thanks so and, much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Peterson, for uh, your wonderful <clears throat> testimony in regards to our building program on the University of Wisconsin. And I just would like to uh, upfront uh, an admonition to all the members of the Board of Regents. This budget is going to be tough to get passed. Uh, we get federal money coming in, and with uh, the, the COVID, every time you get a chance to talk to a legislator, I hope that uh, all of you put out uh, the information necessary that we can give you or you can get very easily about how important this budget is for the future of the University of Wisconsin. So uh, I want to thank you in advance for your efforts and help, and I want to thank you, uh, Chairman Drew Peterson, for your uh, undying uh, support and your tremendous uh, vocal support and your uh, testimony this morning on the building program. I'm going to start with an update, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on the board on our response to COVID-19. I think all of you should be very proud of your university because the university has done extremely well in fighting COVID-19. It's going to highlight both our intent to maximize in-person teaching and learning in fall 2021, as well as a slight bump in case counts at UW-Madison a couple weeks ago. I'm pleased to share with all of you the news that our testing reports are extremely promising, showing an overall positivity, an overall positivity rate of less than 1%, less than 1% on our campuses system-wide. This compares favorably with statewide data even better. And it comes amid our aggressively ramped up testing protocols, which we put in place as all of you have supported on all of our campuses. Already this semester, we have administered more than 350,000 tests across the system. That's more than all of last semester combined. It tells you how aggressive we are in stamping out COVID. In fact, of the daily average 5,556 tests a day on our campuses, we have administered over the past seven days at the 12 UW universities, this excludes UW-Madison, there was an average of just six, in seven days, six positive results over seven days. Isn't that amazing? That's a 0 0.1 tenth of 1% positive rate on our campuses non-existent, almost. We are testing more than ever, and our positive rates are very low. While UW-Madison did experience an increase in positive cases recently, it was a small blip. As reported in the media, testing now indicates encouraging signs. Yesterday, UW-Madison administered 7,345 tests and had only 20 positives for a 0.3 tenths of 1% positive rate. The weekly average at Madison is 0.4 tenths percent. Looking at the bigger picture, the overall positivity rate for the whole UW system this past week was 3 tenths of 1%, compared to 2.6% for the state. I want to commend the dedication and perseverance of our students they are just doing an excellent job uh, they are really watching the, themselves, wearing their masks, social distancing, and going through the testing procedures like we asked them to do. The leadership of our UW chancellors have been exemplary. I couldn't be prouder of a group of individuals who are dedicated for safety for their faculty and their students. And overseeing our efforts and helping to achieve the impressive progress that all of us had on this campus against COVID-19. We're also actively working with our state and healthcare partners to roll out vaccination facilities throughout the state. Where there's a problem, as I said when I took over, 
as the acting president. I want the new university, the new Wisconsin idea to be not only educating everybody in the state that we possibly can and being in all corners of the state, but when there's a problem, I want the University of Wisconsin to step up and fashion a solution which we have in COVID-19. More than 700 UW students, and I think that it's gonna to grow to 1,000, our nursing and other healthcare related fields have signed up for our nursing initiative to assist with providing healthcare services or administer vaccination. I am very proud of our students' commitment, as well as the nursing deans especially. They have been meeting weekly, if not more, and have set up the process so that if anybody needs help in hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living, or if they need vaccination centers, we're helping out the National Guard, we're helping out the state of Wisconsin, we're helping out healthcare professionals. Our students are measuring up and standing up. I had the privilege recently of being on campus at UW-Green Bay and UW-Oshkosh when we open up <clears throat> those sites for vaccination. Next Tuesday, we're going to be launching a vaccination site at UW-La Crosse, and I'm going to be there, and later in the week at UW-Milwaukee. Other campuses are expected to follow soon. The people showing up at these clinics are so grateful. We've got people that have never been on our campuses coming, either to be tested or to get vaccinations. And that just points out, once again, the University of Wisconsin is reaching out to the people of the state of Wisconsin. Come on in, we're ready to help. To give you a sense of what a difference this is making, UWO, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, has administered almost 2,000 vaccinations since their center opened up, including an impressive day on Tuesday when 380 individuals came into our campus on Oshkosh and got shots in their arm. It's great news, and all of us should be proud of the University of Wisconsin. It bears repeating, however, seriously, that while the declining number of COVID cases in Wisconsin and the expanding rollout of vaccinations are very promising, this is no time to let down our guard. We must continue on our campuses to be vigilant and do the right things. Wear a mask, wash your hands, maintain social distancing. We know that this works and we must continue. I am very personally very proud of how our campus communities have responded to this challenge and I commend their commitment to the health and safety of all of our community members. With this in mind, I am optimistic about our planning for the fall of 2021. I've stated publicly that I believe we should have 75% of, of our classes to be held in person. Now, this requires just a little explanation. Prior to the pandemic, we were already doing about 20% of our classes online. So 75% plus the 20%, you're at 95%. So we're almost back to normal, and will be this fall. And that is something I've been telling the legislature, who has been asking us to open up and have more classes in person, that we are gonna open up and get back almost to normal starting this fall, if not normal. A lot of universities have indicated they can do better than 75%, and I applaud those who have offered and hope that they can accomplish that. So as Wisconsin's public university system, we remain committed to keeping our students, our faculty, our staff, and communities healthy and safe. We will continue to encourage our cultural responsibility, our vigilance to respond quickly to any changing situation, and our robust testing program and our growing vaccination assistance are solving problems for the whole state of Wisconsin. As I've said before, and I've told all of you this, and I've told the chancellors too often that they're, that they're starting to repeat it, which is good. If there's a problem, the University of Wisconsin is here to help find a solution. Working together, we will smash COVID as well as solve many problems for the state of Wisconsin. The new University of Wisconsin is something to be reckoned with and something to be proud of. And I keep telling that to all of the people that will listen to me give that speeches all over the state, that we are here to help, 
We want to grow, we want to expand, and we want to educate as many people as we possibly can. I hope you Board of Regents appreciate the job that the chancellors, the faculty, and the students are doing. I'm very proud of them, and thank you for allowing me to give you my report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, President, President Thompson. Thank you for your report. We'll now invite our analysts forward, and we're going to turn our attention to a discussion of how we might develop innovative projects and approaches for connecting students with career opportunities in an increasingly diverse 21st century marketplace. We know that the combination of Wisconsin's continued economic strength and low unemployment numbers is causing increased demand for highly skilled graduates. Experts tell us that many positions are going unfilled across a broad range of employment categories. At the same time, state employers are finding the worker shortage impacts their capacities for business growth and development. This challenge directly aligns with the UW system's efforts to more closely align the resources of the university with the needs of the state. To meet the demands of employers, as well as the interests of the workforce, we must do our part to help more graduates successfully move within the talent pipeline. Fostering that alignment has been a continuing priority of our All In Wisconsin campaign, which seeks closer connection and more conversations between the university and Wisconsin's business and civic community. The COVID pandemic interrupted the campaign's tour on its final stops to campuses around the state where we did meet directly with business and civic leaders to get their significant input and feedback. The need for a strong graduate pipeline that meets Wisconsin's workforce needs has not at all gone away. However, and we must continue to have those conversations that will help maintain and grow the strength of our economy as we exit COVID. Today's panel discussion includes four community development and chamber of commerce leaders who will present helpful perspectives on innovative strategies and actions that may serve to strengthen the system's alignment with business and community partners, and also provide students and graduates with more robust real life work experiences and career opportunities. Can't get on David by Brooke, computer. David mm -hmm. Brukart, our Associate yeah, Vice President of Corporate Relations and but Economic Engagement, will moderate today's discussion. Well, just by and for phone, those that are I not can't... on the panel, I'd encourage you to mute your lines. With that, David, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Regent President Peterson. Day in and day out, the UW system and its university campuses make a significant effort to build strong collaborations with business and community partners. Our chancellors and their teams are zeroed in on the need to prioritize these efforts. And we have heard their success stories at board meetings many times through the years. This topic is also front and center with President Thompson who has worked tirelessly to communicate what he calls the new Wisconsin idea of outreach and community service for the benefit of everyone in Wisconsin. Across the state, hundreds of business and chamber organizations work in rural and urban areas. As Regent Peterson mentioned, today we will hear from the leaders of four dynamic and connected organizations whose job it is to oversee economic challenges and opportunities in diverse geographic quadrants of our state. The purpose is to bring to regions some current, real-time information. We've asked today's panelists to touch on what makes their regions unique and to provide us with insights into the collaborations they have with their partners on campus and to help us understand what lessons they have learned over the years so that we can build even stronger connections as we move beyond the pandemic. With that, we'll begin with introductions. We've asked each of our four panelists to provide a quick two minute background on their chambers, the region and the economies they serve. And we'll start with Ashley DeMuth, who is CEO of the Chamber of Commerce in Menominee, Wisconsin. Ashley. Thank you so much, Dave. And thank you so much for the invitation to present today and talk about perspectives from a chamber and economic development standpoint. Um, again, my name is Ashley DeMuth. I'm the CEO for the Menominee Area Chamber and Visitor Center. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Menominee, we are a rural community up in Northwest Wisconsin. We're about an hour from the Twin Cities and we share the Chippewa Valley with Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls. Um, overall, there are three chambers in our region. 
one in Eau Claire, one in Chippewa Falls, and then of course us here over in Menominee. And collaboratively, um, we serve over 70,000 employees throughout our region. Um, of course, they work for our, our dynamic member businesses and our investors, um, but we are ultimately here to serve that workforce in our community. Uh, speaking of workforce, we, we have a very diverse workforce. Uh, we have large manufacturing facilities who are world known with over 500 plus employees. Uh, we also pride ourselves on having a, a really robust small business circle um, with locally owned and operated small businesses. And we're also seeing an increase in gig economy and individual entrepreneurship, um, which brings us to one of our number one challenges in our community, uh, which is affecting both education and workforce, which is broadband. Um, and we are hearing that as gig economy and in, in excuse me, independent entrepreneurship grows, um, we are lacking some of the services that we need to keep people here in our community. Um, although COVID-19 has affected our community pretty severely, uh, we are still seeing some ro robust economic development opportunities and um, we still do have businesses that are coming to our community and are, are building and surviving and thriving. So we're very proud of that. Um, we often joke that we are not a community with a university, but we are a university with a community surrounding us. Um, so the University of Wisconsin Stout definitely is a landmark in our community. Uh, they help us bring people to our community. They help us retain folks in our community, and they really help us build our workforce. And through the last year, we really have realized um, how much that university really does affect us and our businesses and our workforce. And we hear every single day um, how we cannot wait to get back to our, our normal stance. Um, and UW-Stout has done just a really great job uh, navigating COVID-19 and being in touch with our businesses as well as our Chamber of Commerce to help create community success. Thank you, Ashley. Next, let's let's go to Becky Bartosik, who is president and CEO of the Fox Cities Chamber of Commerce and Regional Partnership. Becky, thank you, David. And we really appreciate this opportunity to meet with the regions today. Uh, this is a conversation we've actually been having for I think almost two years. So excited! It's very exciting for this day to come. Um, as David mentioned, uh, my name is Becky Bartosik. I'm the president and CEO of the Fox Cities Chamber of Commerce. Our chamber has a very large footprint for most the size of most chambers. We actually cover two and a half counties. So it's the northern half of Winnebago, all of Outagamie, and all of Calumet County. So essentially Nina Menasha up through Brown County, as well as going all the way over to New London to the west and Brilliant to the east. So it's it's a size footprint that we cover and really have a thriving economic development organization that services that footprint. So it's interesting because not only do we have more suburban, but we also have rural needs for our employers in that footprint. So as Ashley mentioned, one of our biggest challenges throughout the state, as well as here locally, is lack of talent to fill our positions. Um, there was a survey that was done recently, I believe two weeks ago, asking employers in the state of Wisconsin what their top concerns were. And the results were a little surprising because it came back, number one was lack of talent to fill their open positions, and number two was COVID. So we were a little surprised that those numbers weren't flipped. So, but to give you a good idea of what those, those statistics actually are, throughout the month of February, we have a, a software program which is called Jobs EQ that gives us a great snapshot of what's going on in our footprint. And we were shocked to see that last month we had 6,000 open jobs to fill just here in the Fox Valley. Yesterday, I asked my team to run the numbers again so that I could share the most updated figures with you. And as of yesterday, we have 8,300 open jobs to fill. So we have a tremendous amount of opportunity and we absolutely are excited about the partnership with the UW system. With that being said, uh, David had also asked us to share some of the ways that we do currently partner with the UW systems. And obviously we, we work very closely with the, with the facility here in Appleton as well as UW Oshkosh 
um, but we may be a little bit more known for our talent upload program, which is a program that we ran for a number of years where we actually brought between 70 and 80 different students from 16 Midwest universities into Appleton. It was all expense paid, and it was an opportunity for those students who were majoring in business, computer science, and engineering to come and spend three days here in the Fox Cities to meet our employers, tour their facilities. They actually had the opportunity to meet and hear, this, hear our community leaders speak about living here in the area as well as attend young professional events. And it finally wrapped up the entire event with a gigantic scavenger hunt throughout the Fox City. So they got to see little pieces of it. In 2015, the Talent Upload Program actually received the Best in Show Award from the International Economic Development Council. So that was quite, quite an accolade for us for that program. But what we found in 2018 of uh, the program that had been thriving and had proven to be so successful, and all of the UW campuses were invited, and I believe many participated in that program. But in 2018, we couldn't fill the buses, and we found out that the world had changed, and those students no longer had to get on a bus to come here because the recruiters were all over the campuses. So we come up with some creative ideas on how we can approach that. And we've done some creative things. And uh, that started my conversation with Drew Peterson. And we look forward to sharing more of that today. Thank you, Becky. I've been uh, tallying the, the, the word count on talent. And, and I've already heard people mention that about nine times. And, and, and the other big word is COVID. Let's now move to um, our third presenter who is Magabi Patel, who is not only president, the board of directors of the Platteville Regional Chamber, but also a business owner and has dealt personally with the challenges of COVID in her region. Magabi. Thank you, David. And thank you, Board of Regents, for this opportunity. I uh, am losing my voice uh, this morning, woke up with bad spring allergies with the good weather. So just let me know if you cannot hear me. I'll try to be loud as I can. But um, as David introduced me, I am a second generation hotel. My family owns and operates hotels and uh, economy and mid-scale hotels here in Southwest Wisconsin. So I love tourism, I love economy, and I love talking about these topics. Um, today I'm here representing the Platteville Regional Chamber as the president for the board of directors. And I have been in this role since January of 2021. So fairly new to this, but been a chamber member for quite a while. So I feel like I can fill in and talk about our region here. So uh, Platteville is one of the largest cities in Southwest Wisconsin in Grant County. Uh, that being said, we call ourselves a regional chamber since we spread out the county here, and we service about 300 members annually as a regional chamber. Our main goal here as a chamber, along with promoting tourism, is promoting the business and developing a community development plan to help these businesses. We are in rural Wisconsin between rolling hills and fields, so we proudly call ourselves the Driftless Region. So um, that being said, I honestly call us the land of opportunity. Might sound big, but we have everything that anyone is looking for. We have the beautiful and rich cultural heritage on agriculture. So we have a lot of agricultural industry base here, a lot of farming. And then one of our biggest industry is the dairy industry. We have big companies like Emirat, Saputo, like Talis, from all over the world that have their plants here in the Platteville area and they help our economy over here. Um, one of the big reasons these companies choose to come here is UW Platteville. So uh, we are a small town where we, the population of Platteville and the economy is strongly influenced by UW Platteville. Um, I feel like they grow, we grow, we don't have a way without them. And they are one of the biggest employers in our region as well. Um, and that doesn't limit us. We have a lot of engineering firms that brought uh, their companies to Platteville just because of the engineering program at UW Platteville. 
Along with that, we have manufacturing plants around us. And one of the newest uh, one is Cummins, a Fortune 500 company that's going to be opening a manufacturing plant right in Platteville in April of 2022. So that being said, I feel like we have a little bit of tourism, a little bit of economy, and one of the biggest concerns of our area, as the ladies mentioned earlier, is broadband. UW Platteville has been a great supporter by providing their network for the city and nonprofit use, but we still struggle with broadband internet for all our small local businesses. So that is one of the concerns. And a big concern in our area is workforce retention. We find it hard to keep our citizens in our community. We have them come to UWP, but our biggest challenge is uh, keeping them in our community. So that's something I would like to really talk about is workforce retention today. Thank you. Thank you, Magavi. We've now heard from three chamber leads. We will move to uh, head of the Racine County Economic Development Corporation, Jenny Trick, who has some insights from her region of the state. Jenny, if you would. Good morning, everybody. Thank you again for this opportunity. I'm Jenny Trick. I'm the Executive Director of the Racine County Economic Development Corporation. We are a private nonprofit organization originally established in 1983. We serve all of Racine County. We have a staff of 13 that are focused on implementing our mission, which is to grow the property tax base in Racine County and create jobs for our residents. Racine County is located in southeast Wisconsin, just north of the Wisconsin-Illinois border. We are one of seven counties that are comprised of the Milwaukee 7 region. Our region has 2 million people and more than 1 million in our workforce. In regards to talent, our employers also have access to the densely populated area in northern Illinois with an Amtrak station centrally located as well as a metro station located just south of us, employers have greater access to employees outside of our region. Nonetheless, the supply of talent remains a challenge. I should have noted, I've been with the organization uh, 29 years and talent has always been on the minds of employers, but never before now has it been voiced by so many industries at various sizes um, it is just ubiquitous. So I'm very excited to learn from our other panelists this morning, as well as the regions of how we can tackle this challenge, hopefully with the supply of graduates that serve all of our regions. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, all of our panelists have talked about their relationships with the uh, university campuses in the region. I'd like to maybe dive into that a little deeper if we could. And, and, and have the panelists tell us a little bit about how your organizations are specifically working with those universities and highlight, if you will, some of the ways, again, that you've already touched on that are making, the university is making a difference in, in your community. Maybe we can start with um, Ashley again. Let's, let's move back to Ashley. So as I said before, we, we kind of talk about how we're, we're a university with a community surrounding us, right? Um, our workforce collaborates with our university on our high level. Um, our, our chamber collaborates with the university on a high level. Um, kind of swinging back around to the broadband discussion um, during different committee meetings throughout the community. Um, the chancellor and I happen to, to be on some of those community committees together. And um, when talking about some of the challenges that were brought forth to our chamber that were uh, COVID related and ultimately are, we're seeing them as being a long-term challenge with broadband access. We started having conversations at a more university um, local collaborative level about what are other communities doing? And the venture home project was actually brought up. Um, in, in an effort to talk about what, what are some strategic ways that we can connect the university and the community and what are some strategic ways that we can also bring workforce into that. And with having an increase of folks that are telecommuting, um, working from home, they need broadband access and being a rural community, I know we've lived in our home for 10 years and we just, we just got DSL at our house two years ago. Um, really difficult with teenage children. And as we're looking at universities for my, my teenage son, who's a junior, 
uh, you know, we're, we're talking about what happens if he needs to e-learn and can he do that from home and what are the opportunities. Um, so these conversations have really started and, and the university has been a key player in those conversations, also talking about the needs of their students and how do we retain those students here in our community. And UW Stout is involved in so many different efforts um, to do that, whether it be through placements for internships and co-ops. Um, let's get let's get these university students involved in our workforce here and they can see what we have to offer in the quality of life and how do we retain them here in the community. We also host an event um, through a collaboration with UW Stout called Meet Menominee, uh, where we bring all of our member businesses, they're invited to host a booth and essentially it's expo style. We get those businesses on campus in front of the students, learning about the students' needs, what their interests are. And those businesses can also promote what they have available for internships and careers, help them career path, um, because ultimately we do wanna keep people here in our community. And UW Stout has been just a, such a fantastic partner and driver for that event. Um, and it's a great way for us just, again, to connect those businesses to the university in, in the best ways possible. And we also offer an event that is a junior chamber career fair where we involve the high school students and we invite the local university to talk about pipeline projects and career pathing. So we start also connecting those K-12 students to the university so we can start promoting again, how do we keep them in our community? How do we keep them locally? How do we keep them in state? Um, but ultimately, again, UW Stout does a great job um, with that career pathing and helping students get that hands-on learning, again, polytechnic experience um, for their future careers. Ash, Ashley mentioned the, the Venture Home Project, which is a WISIS initiative, which takes the university out into the communities. And we're working with WISIS uh, to take the beginning success story of Venture Home, which began with um, WISIS in Eau Claire, to other campuses around the state, uh, thanks to some support from President Thompson on that initiative. That's, that's a subject for a whole nother day. And I think we can we can uh, talk a little bit more now with Becky about something she just teased us with a bit a, mi a bit ago about a, a project she has been working on again on the issue around talent. So Becky, if you can elaborate on that a little bit more, that would be helpful. Oh, absolutely. And here in Appleton, it's we're structured a little bit differently because um, if you read about the history of Appleton. Lawrence University was actually here first and the city of Appleton built around Lawrence University. But I can honestly tell you from the chamber perspective, uh, we work far more closely with the UW system and Fox Valley Tech. Um, Chancellor Levitt and I sit on a number of boards together and we know that they are you know, just a tremendous partner for all of the initiatives that we, we do. Uh, for example, every year we do a career fair where we bring in 3000 students and UW Oshkosh is always involved in that. And we actually held it yesterday virtually and UW Oshkosh helped us with that in, as well. But to get to the point of what you were talking about, David, um, I mentioned earlier that we had this program that was called uh, Talent Upload, that in 2018, we couldn't fill the buses. So we reached out to the, the universities throughout the Midwest, the 16 universities and said, where are we off? Why is this not working? What's how can we how can we morph this? Because we know it needs to change. And I can honestly say Michigan Tech gave us some fantastic insight. And they were a fantastic partner for us, allowing us to start an initiative that we call Fox Cities Days. And Fox Cities Days has been all over uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan recruiting people to this area. And I have been working with Chancellor Levitt. We started the discussions about doing it in UW Oshkosh, uh, but this little thing called COVID popped up. But let me tell you how Fox Cities Days works. And if you can imagine this, um, when we were on Michigan Tech's campus, essentially what we did is we took our employers on a road trip. And our mission was to, as a community, talk to students about why they would want to live here in the Fox Cities. Not necessarily about specific jobs, but why the Fox Cities is the right place for these recent graduates to come and make their home. So if any of you have ever been on Michigan Tech's campus, their student union is next to their library. And we took over the heart of their campus. 
essentially we had five large tents in the middle of Michigan Tech's campus. So when you stepped out from the library or from the student union, the first thing that you saw was a Pierce fire engine next to a Humvee and an Oshkosh Corp slash Pierce manufacturing tent. And when those students walked out and they looked at that Humvee or they looked at that fire engine, um, someone would walk up and say, hey, this is really cool. Would you like to come and live in the Fox Cities and engineer these with us? Then there was a tent adjacent to that where we had a live band playing. In the tent that was adjacent to that, you could smell where we were cooking hamburgers and brats. In the middle of it all was a gigantic tent that was full of our employers. And it was Kimberly Clark, it was Aaron's Corporation, it was both of our competing hospital networks side by side, um, talking about all the opportunities in the Fox Cities. So when a student would walk up to the largest tent, the first 100 students got bright yellow t-shirts that said Destination Fox Cities. And when they went into the tent, if they had a really good conversation with our employers, they received a, a coupon to go and get free lunch. But it couldn't just be a, you know, a lame, hi, who are you, what's your name? It had to be a legitimate conversation about you know, what you were going to school for and what you were looking for. Um, I believe the statistics, the statistics are hard to get our arms around just because it was promoting the region, not specific jobs at that part of the, of the program. But I do know that Kimberly Clark walked away with 72 uh, resumes that they were going to follow up on. I do know that the Wabat group had told me that they had intentions of making offers to three of the students they spoke to that day. So we were told by Michigan Tech, if we had 100 students check in that day, it would be a success. When we reached 600 students, we had to shut that part of the event down because we had reached our capacity. So when we closed in the middle of the campus, we actually moved to an off-site location where, the, where the, the faculty was invited to meet with our employers, as well as specific students that our employers wanted to have deeper conversations with. Now we knew filling one job was important, but we knew the connections with the faculty and our employers was even a bigger deal because that was creating a talent pipeline for our employers. So we actually moved to a, an offsite location and it had hundreds of people come through again. Um, here in Appleton, uh, Michigan Tech has two graduates that started the beer factory, the Appleton Beer Factory. And they even came on the road with us and hosted uh, just a great party afterwards. So fast forward two weeks, Michigan Tech followed up with us and said, hey, we've got good news and bad news for you. I said, all right, they said, your program was so successful that we are actually going to change the way that we have employers come onto campus. We are gonna move away from industry days and we are gonna start doing regional days because what they found was the response from the students was just fantastic because there was something for everyone versus just for the engineers or just for IT or whatever it may have been that day. That day. So we would love to expand Fox Cities days throughout the state of Wisconsin. So please consider that, um, you know, for further conversations. I know that we hopefully will do that in Oshkosh as soon as we can. Um, but that's that's kind of the quick and dirty on the Fox Cities day. Thank you, Becky. And I can hear some of our chancellors thinking we want you to be focused on our students here in this state. And I can hear uh, President Thompson saying we don't want those students to be going to school in Michigan. We want them to stay here in the first place. Things are very competitive, aren't they? Um, yes, and I feel the same way. I don't want them to leave our state, but if they do, I want them coming back. <laughs> can, can you tell us a little bit about the story of your son who is being recruited for, for his, his college? Oh, absolutely. I was telling David when we were doing a, a, a call about three or four weeks ago that I actually have a son who is a senior right now. And I have been, actually, I have a senior and a junior in high school in my house right now. And I don't remember the last time that I received a piece of mail because every day I walk in with a gigantic stack of flyers that have come from all over the country trying to recruit those two kids out of our state. And it, it breaks my heart because, you know, I've even gone to their counselors and said, 
what is the situation here that I, you know, every day we're receiving dozens of flyers and, you know, the counselors have even told me, we have a great relationship with the UW system. Whatever you're receiving is actually coming from outside of the schools. So, but, you know, last summer at one point, I finally went to my, my son who is a senior and said, what do you want to do with all of this? And he said, please just throw this away because I can't keep up with the thousands of emails that I have from schools outside of the area. So I, I really understand the challenge of what you're running through and, and we're hopeful that we can find a way to help eliminate some of that noise or at least be a partner, uh, just knowing that these kids are inundated. And you know, I, one of the things I did share with David is that my son's team, his football team last year was one of the lucky teams that actually had the opportunity to play. So every Friday I had the opportunity to talk to a group of parents and there were 22 seniors on that team. I can tell you before we had even reached the November 1st cutoff for admittance into, um, for consideration uh, for Madison, I know that of those 22 students, six of those students were recruited to Minnesota and those kids were doing everything they could to take as many of their friends with them. So uh, me, we are completely, completely in alignment that we would, do not want to see our best and brightest moving in that direction. So any partnership or any ideas you have with the chambers, we'd love to help support. It. Well, and our, camp, our campuses are all very, very focused on those things. UW-Madison has its success works, our, our, our career services uh, offices on all the campuses are working on virtual career tracks. And we've got uh, a talent generator and a, a um, Career Connect initiative going. What you're saying is that we we can never do too much. No, no, you really can't. And I was telling uh, UW Oshkosh the other day when we were having a conversation, uh, one of the things that I was most impressed with were the direct emails that I did receive from UW Oshkosh to the parents. And I've seen that from some of the other UW schools as well. Um, that's where I saw that they were actually being definitely making a difference where the schools outside of the state were not doing that. Thank you, Becky. Let's let's move to Racine and have a conversation again with Jenny Trick, who has seen some uh, amazing changes in that part of the state, working with her campuses and working with the uh, industry coming in and uh, looking at what's happening just over the border in Illinois. Jenny, if you could talk a little bit about that for us, please. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I ha I'm really happy to hear that there's so many good stories from our panelists about the good working relationship they have with the universities. But I I'm sorry to tell you, we still have the best chancellor in Kenosha with UW Park Science Chancellor Ford. Um, she, I've not, you know, as I said, I've been with the organization for 29 years. And so I've had the great opportunity to work with many chancellors at UW Parkside. Um, but she is one unique lady in which she has really tried to be very uh, proactive about establishing a link between the local college and our business community in a greater way than I've seen in the past. And so this might mean just, you know, lunches and different networking and so on, but it's meaningful because it gets people talking and that's really what it's all about. Um, I will mention in our research, the, the opportunity for communities to have the greatest retention of the talent that's produced by the UW system, we have found really comes through internship programs. It's important to have those interns uh, be robust and deep, sometimes partnered with mentors, um, but also really encouraging um, more than one internship opportunity, getting the feel of many communities, many companies throughout Racine County. And so to that end, we really concentrated our efforts and our partnership with the UW Parkside to focus on that. We have one staff member that is an active volunteer working on an intern uh, consortium. She also has consulted with the Parkside's business and community engagement uh, program and its director to increase the penetration into our business community. And then we have also done, like many of you folks in 2020, pivoted to a lot of virtual learning. And we hosted a couple of webinars with Parkside on the Handshake program, um, as well as the value of continuing education. 
Um, in 2019, I believe it was, we partnered with Parkside on Smart Cities. And um, if you haven't heard about Foxconn, I think you have completely shut yourself off to the news. But our county is home to Foxconn. And really since the uh, entry of that company into our community in 2017, my life certainly has never been the same, and I don't anticipate it uh, returning to anything what I would call normal. And so with that, really our mind has been on talent. Um, in 2018, I believe it was, we engaged the Manpower Group to do a talent supply study for us. And they did that by looking at our unemployment numbers, but they also interviewed um, about 100 employers in Racine County to understand what some of their most challenging positions are that are difficult to fill. And then they incorporated some of Foxconn's projected numbers, scaled way back, um, really only a fraction of what they were projecting. And along with the various developments um, that were occurring and businesses that had been recruited to Racine County, it was anticipated by the end of 2021 that we would have 5,000 open positions. And COVID has certainly changed that slightly, um, but there isn't a day that goes by that our staff who is actively outreaching to our businesses in Racine County, that talent is not brought up. So it does concern me greatly. Um, and if the question comes up about what keeps you up at night, and I would have to say it used to be budget um, as a director of an organization, but right now it's really talent because it's coming from every um, direction and in every industry, as well as every size business. So this is something that I think we all have to work in a very different way to come out with some different um, results that we haven't seen before. Jenny, you mentioned interns, which is one of the gold standards for connecting your campus experience to a career. And I, I'd like to just ask Drew if he would want to uh, spend a minute talking about internships. It's something that his company, TDS, does a lot of in, the, in this virtual space, which is not an easy thing to do and a bit of a challenge. And then maybe we can open this up to some questions or comments from chancellors or, or, or regents. Well, thank you, Dave. And, and certainly to our panelists, you know, this is exactly what I think the regents were looking for is just insights direct insights from your regions of the state on how you're uh, combating these challenges. You know, we're just one company, you know, and we probably produce about 100 internships annually. Uh, we did see a bit of a dip with COVID, and I'm incredibly impressed with how our human resources team and our IT folks were able to pivot those uh, experiences to online, to online onboarding, um, you know, to getting talent from across the state to participate. We've now structured, obviously, um, uh, affiliations with Madison, uh, with uh, UW Oshkosh, uh, and now with UW Parkside, uh, as well as other campuses. But what we're finding is, you know, the talent that we're receiving from our campuses is, is, first, is first rate. Uh, the challenges we face is getting enough folks in those STEM fields, whether it's IT, data networking, whether it's uh, applied computer science. Um, and we just look to continue to build an arms race to, uh, to improve that. Um, you know, I think across the state, we hear this routinely from employers. The need for internships has never been more important. It's the best way to build a new vitality with your workforce. Uh, and I think that's what regents are most interested in. How can we supplement businesses, civic organizations, and get them that next generation talent? And to Becky's point, how do we do that by maintaining our best and brightest and retaining them in the state? Not because we're shackling them to stay here, but because we're giving them great opportunities to grow, to develop family, to develop, you know, family sustaining jobs. Uh, I, I think that's one of the keynote priorities of this board. I know it's the keynote priority of President Thompson. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that we were kind of giving daylight to all of the things that are going on and then the things that we can continue to do. I'm certain that regions have thoughts, comments, questions, and, and Dave, I'd invite them to, uh, to, to uh, introduce those to the panel.
Um, Regent Peterson, this is Regent Bechtel. Good morning, Regent Bechtel. Good morning. Um, I'm lucky enough to do a lot of work in this space, so thank you for putting this on today's agenda. Uh, incredibly important, and I know a lot of the regents are very focused on development of the talent pool, uh, as are the chancellors across the, the state. Um, I just want to emphasize that I think one of the key partnerships is what we're talking about today uh, between the UW system, the chambers of commerce, and the businesses and institutions connected with that. When I've done economic development, and whether it was, and Jenny, nice to see you, by the way, uh, from Racine, whether it was Foxconn, Haribo, Canel, you know, a bunch of the companies that are filling in in that pipeline, I'm sorry, the, the corridor between Milwaukee and, uh, and uh, Chicago, the partnerships that those businesses see between these linkages of how they are going to solve their talent issues, because these talent issues are across the country. They're not just in southeast Wisconsin or across Wisconsin, obviously. And so there's a tremendous and it's probably my greatest surprise in working in this space is the cohesion and the way that chancellors work with their local communities. And um, it's a tremendous selling point uh, to the businesses that are thinking about either establishing operations here or expanding. So this is really critical stuff. Um, there's a lot of granular work that needs to be done and is being done. I mean, as simple as internships and mentoring are, I mean, this, this goes back to uh, the industrial age, uh, but those are very important because it's creating the connections between the young student and those more experienced persons who are already rooted in their communities and wanna sell their communities. So I think there's a lot of basic blocking and tackling that we can all increase and do more of. Um, and I guess I'd just be an advocate of more connections between UW and, and the business community and just keep this stuff as simple as possible uh, because those relationships are really what key and what kind of open up the doors to uh, refill the talent pipeline and, and make us more of a magnet for, for young students across the country. I mean, it's only as complicated as we make it. And the focus here is making connections between campuses and chambers and economic development agencies and civic organizations and anything that we can do to amplify that, I think, is time well spent. Other questions from regions. I will also uh, um, ask chancellors to, if they have comments in a minute. I'll start with Regent Bogos. Good morning, Amy. Thank you very much, Regent Peterson. Um, and thank you so much for that amazing presentation. It's so helpful. And it, it's really daunting um, when we were told just now that 8,300 8, open jobs in um, the Fox Valley, that's, that's crazy to me. So I, I think, um, you know, just, ac uh, just echoing Regent Bechtel, it doesn't have to be complicated. And I think already um, what's being done is just incredible. But I know just from my own experience with my own children, I have two, two or three graduates from the UW system. And I think alumni is like a huge resource for so much of this because when someone graduates undergrad, you know, it's been a while for many of us and you're thrown out into the world, you're off a train that you've been put on by your parents since you were in kindergarten. It's very daunting, it's very, you know, a lot of them feel, because I've talked to many students over the years, and they feel that they've just been kicked off this train. They have no clue what to do. And the, the fact what you did um, up in Michigan State, I would love to see more of that because it, students want to feel like they have, you know, they don't know what they're doing. So many of them are lost at that point. It's so scary. Like my own daughter's about to graduate UW-Madison. She's terrified. So to have someone that just shows that they care but even before that, with internships, and I know a couple of kids who went out on their own and reached out to, they went through lists and lists of firms that had all over with the state, where did you go to school? Did you go to UW? And they, they got aggressive on their own, just reaching out to these alumni. And so much of the time, a lot of the alumni think, oh, you're just after our money, which is nice too. But it's a really simple ask. Can you talk to this person and you graduated in the same field from one of these schools, a tech school, you know, look at me now and I want to help you. And I think connections in any way, in all ways is so important, just like we just learned in the presentation. So um, just echoing mostly what, what Regent Bechtel said and the presentation said, and I think it's, it's easy enough. We just have to keep working harder. So thank you. 
Thank you, Regent Bogost. I'm going to go to Regent Greeby and then Regent Klein. Michael. I have a question for our panelists. First of all, thank you very much for being here today. Um, and I'd echo one of the things that Regent Bogo said about the remarkable number of opportunities that you described as existing in your regions and the opportunities to work with the UW system. Here's my question from your position outside the university system. What is your biggest challenge in making those connections to the extent that there are obstacles in making this work? for you, for your businesses, for your communities, and for our students, what gets in the way? I can speak to that and certainly welcome the other panelists as well. I don't have a problem connecting with the university. As I mentioned, our chancellor is uh, very open to opportunities of collaboration. But I think speaking on behalf of businesses, people are busy. People are simply busy trying to operate and retain the talent that they have. And as robust as the internship programs might be, it is very difficult for them to take time away and to understand the system, as well as potentially uh, participate in an internship event, uh, to research how does one even develop uh, an internship program on site. They don't have the resources to do it. The majority of the businesses that are in Racine County have less than 100 employees, and that tends to mean that they don't have the operations infrastructure to do the type of support and strategic planning that this might require. So there's some pretty good information that I've seen recently where the business community is invited into a college through something called a micro intern program. Hearing more and more of this, in fact, I think it was this week that the Kansas Board of Regents just adopted this as part of their strategic plan. This might be another opportunity to engage the business community into the college because that's the challenge. Everybody wants to knock on the door of Chancellor Ford. They're busy and frankly, it's a little intimidating because you want to welcome maybe the business community into a classroom, but good Lord, I still have nightmares about missing that final or going through the halls and can't find my class. I'm not alone. So I think if we can make it as easy as possible, which is the word many of you are using, and really map out that pathway to penetrate the talent for our business community, I think you'll have a little bit more success. I absolutely agree with you. And to, to add to that, I think there's an opportunity. I think, I think all the chambers work really well with the UW system. Um, but when we talk about creating these internships, there's another step that we've been talking about here in the Fox Cities, and our employers are really excited about it. And it's connecting our interns with our young professionals organizations. Because especially what's been happening the past 18 months or the past 12 months, when you have an intern that comes to your community, or if your intern has to do it virtually, they have no connection to the community. And they really don't know anyone other than who they work with when they're doing their internship. So they go home at night, they've worked long, hard days, and all they want to do is go home because they don't know anyone. So we're making every effort right now for this next summer, making sure that all of our interns that we're aware of from our, from our employers are included in all of our young professional opportunities because that way they will create networks, they will create lifetime friendships, and when they receive that offer from our, from our employers, they are far more likely to really consider relocating here to the Fox Cities. But you know, we, we're only aware of those internships through our employers. So if there was a way to do that to the school, we could be more inclusive to make sure that we make that internship experience even better. And kind of laying into what Becky and Jenny had shared, um, you know, how, how can your universities use our organizations to be a connector or a liaison between that? Um, how can we better educate our businesses about what, what, um, what the needs are for internships, what, what the restrictions are, what the guidelines are? Um, how can we connect our businesses who we're already having potentially daily conversations with? How can we help lighten some of that load for the university? How, and same with the y, YP, Young Professionals Programs, how can we also help build those skill sets to make those students more successful and create a community for them so they want to stay here? 
right? If they're completing an internship, um, they're, they're gaining a community within the business that they're going to be completing that internship with, they're, com they're in that community of the YP, how can we create a community that they don't want to leave so they stick around? But I would like to add, like, I think we all focus a lot on our bigger corporations and bigger companies that we have in the area for all our internships uh, that are offered. I feel that there need to be a step taken uh, between the chamber and the university partnership where we focus on the smaller businesses, the local businesses, because I think that's where the communication is missing. The UW staff at each of our universities need to be involved in the local community and inform the local businesses about the potential they have, the resources they have. It's all there, it's established, it's just the communication in between with the small businesses that we see missing in our area. So we would like to see more of the university from each department communicating or coming to business after hours and getting to know the, know the locals so they can, you know, give information back and forth to the students, bring information back to the businesses and see where we can build those connections. Sometimes it might not be a big internship, but a small local business could use a student for a project and they just don't know how to get connected. So I feel like we do a great job at connecting our bigger companies, but it's our small local businesses that need to connect. And they are so busy with their day-to-day. -day. They have a limited staff that they don't have the time to go find these resources. So I feel like ch a chambers could be a great way to coordinate and get university and the local small businesses connected to build this relation. Thank you, Magadi. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the work that uh, you have done with UW Platteville around the outreach to the, the tri-state area? I think that's a, a similar kind of program to what Becky was describing with Fox Cities. Yeah, so we at the chamber before a few years realized that these the similar issues that all of you ladies have been talking about with workforce retention being the number one issue and housing being another issue in our rural area. So what we've done is we have partnered with UW Platteville with one of the biggest partners. We have partnered with Southwest Tech, um, CISA 3, and then we have a chamber alliance for all the small chambers in Southwest Wisconsin. So together we have created a workforce task force. And every year they put up a summit that, uh, that addresses the issues. With COVID, we could not do that last year. Again, we come back to COVID. So we took a virtual take on that for 2021. So we created a series of seminars that we're gonna do virtually. Uh, the first one started in February, February 24th and concentrated on construction. And one yesterday that concentrated on apprenticeship programs because that's a great, we have noticed we have connected young individuals from colleges to our businesses uh, on top of internships. And then we have a big one on March 10th, which is gonna concentrate on housing in Southwest Wisconsin. Um, unlike some of the bigger areas, we find that when new people move, so university recruits someone and the family moves in town, we don't have the first starter home that's available easily. We have college student housing, and then we have regular housing, but we don't have enough to fulfill that. And I can totally relate, we own hotels right in Platteville. And once in a while, I walk down to my front desk while people are eating breakfast and we'll have a conversation and they live in the hotel for over a month till they can actually find a house for an apartment. So housing has been a big one. So going back to this um, summits that we have been creating, we call them the Business and Education Summit, where university, especially UWP has been a great, great member um, helping us out with this. They come and present the opportunities and resources they have to all our attendees. They are free to attend, any small or big business can attend and take back home what they don't know. Um, we have also gone a step further this year. We've noticed that people don't have time to attend from the day to day. So at the end of each summit, we are creating a 10 minute video that we just email each of our members. So they didn't get to attend, they got a summary and they can reach us to find more information on those topics if they were interested. 
So that's that's kind of our big thing. I kind of brought a flyer. I don't know if it's visible, and I'm not allowed to screen. But if anyone's interested, I'll be happy to share more information about the uh, work we are doing with our workforce task force. Another thing I like to highlight about our relation with the university, we have a great working relationship with Chancellor Shields here. I feel like he gets, he keeps involved in all our um, events that we happen at the chamber and we put together. But one of the biggest events that we put together um, is done with the university. It's co-hosted by the university at the University Pilot Farm, which is their um, farming education center. We call it D on the Farm. Uh, the event is hosted every two years, a biannual event. What we do is it's hosted on parents weekend. So we know the kids will be there, the parents will be there, and all the local community is invited to attend for free. In the past, we've seen over 1,000 people to up to 3,000 attend this event. What we do is there is uh, live music playing on the side for people coming just for entertainment. But the biggest highlight is self-guided farm tours and uh, egg-related demonstrations by our industry partners. So we invite all the egg and dairy-related industries to come set up booths as vendors and demonstrate what they're looking for. It could be demonstrating their product. It could be demonstrating what their employees do. And it could be anything like cheese tasting. It's a lot of different variety. We don't put limits on what they can do there. We just want them to showcase their products, their companies, and their needs for employment. So I feel that is a big event that I would like to highlight because we work hard. University provides the backbone for this event. And we have an egg tourism committee at our chamber that kicks in and um, does all the work for the event. One of the biggest help for this big event is the egg groups from campus. So Sigma Alpha has been a big group that helps us set up and tear down the event because we run into issues with having volunteers. So I feel like university is truly the backbone here, providing us for stage to highlight agriculture and dairy industry for our area. And it's great because not just the college kids get to visit, it's open to locals. So any age kids come in and they see the potential of what agriculture and dairy can do for them. They actually have educational stuff, even at these little day on the farm summits where they will educate you that, hey, if you want to be a farmer, this is what we have for you. They introduce the kids to the local FFA groups during the event. So it, I can go on and on about it. But um, in short, it's a great day to come together, introduce the farming life. I moved here before a few, before 10 years from Madison. And it was interesting for myself to go see demonstration, how you milk a cow, how technology helps in that process. So just little things, you get educated and the kids see the potential that, hey, I'm going to school for this and this is what I can do with it. And it connects them to the employers in the area. So that's a big one that I like to highlight. But along with that, Something that we have come to realize at our chamber is fostering the transformative education of lifelong learning. That's something we are highly focusing on because we want our high school, middle school, our kids to stay in the area. We don't want them to go away to Madison and Milwaukee, even though we love those areas. So uh, what we have done is UWP has come up with great programs. A simple program I would name is a Lego League program. The university staff, along with students, goes to our middle schools, elementary schools, and it's an after-school program where they promote STEM education to the kids. And the student helpers talk about what they do in college, how much fun they are having. And I can relate because my fifth grader is a part of this program for two years, and she loves it. Another one is girls in coding. Um, same thing, they go to the middle school and high school and introduce STEM and coding. So these kids get the idea of what it is to be in this area. And it's nice because the college students actually volunteer with the professors and talk about their college experience. So it's building it from early high school levels that there is opportunities right here. Stay here, you can get a job here. If you have a dream, we can build up on that. So that's been our main focus in the last few years is lifelong learning, staying locally. Thank, Thank you, Magali. Magali.
I, I want to keep us on pace. I think we have about seven or eight minutes left. I know that Regent Klein has a question as well as Regent Weatherly, and I'd like to give the chancellors a moment to make some comments as well. So if we can do them in sort of a truncated fashion, I'll turn it over to Regent Klein. Tracy. Regent Weatherly, Kyle, would you like to take the stage and we'll see if we can get Tracy back? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, the last two or three years at my startup company, we've consistently had three or four interns from UWM and they've been fantastic. But of course, I've always um, asked them about what their other experiences are like, what their, their peers are. So I have a question from the from a student perspective they reported to me of uh they didn't use these words but an uneven experience or a wide variance in what internships looked like for for their peer students in some cases um uh corporations small businesses gave them great opportunities to learn great opportunities to network you know a pathway in into a future job and others and now i will use their words you know they were treated as like a, a potted plant and they, you know, they were pretty consistent on this, on the wide variance of internship experience, depending on the company, depending on who they were reporting to. Is, is this anecdotal? Is this something that you guys see from your perspective in terms of the internship experience um, from a learning perspective and from a career development perspective? From our experience working with interns, what you're hearing is exactly what we hear. Um, we have to be careful that an internship doesn't end up to be cheap, easy labor, you know, and I've heard of a lot of interns that were, were turned off because they basically were asked to do filing for the summer. And that's not the point of an internship. So, yeah, we do try to work closely with our employers. We, we, are, we are lucky because we have a lot of employers that have fantastic internship programs, but you're spot on. Uh, the feedback we're hearing is all over the map. Same for us. We um, we have often heard from some businesses, many businesses, that interns are used as contingent workforce, essentially, and and that shouldn't be the case. I mean, our our students need our employers, but our employers need our students as well. So how do you find a fine line of balance with that? And I think that that really goes back to what I said earlier. How do we educate our businesses? about what an internship is and those expectations. Um, obviously the university does a great job with that, um, with their communications with the businesses, but how as chambers can we help drive that home? Um, as well as how can we involve those students who are interning again in those programs to help build skills elsewhere and empower them, um, you know, to, if they're, if they're not feel, if they're feeling like a potted plant, um, what are some ways that they can approach that business and talk about more ways to be involved? How can they become a more dynamic part of the team and not feel like they're just a, an internship placement? We want them to feel at home. Uh, thank you. Okay. I know we're short on time, so I won't follow up with this question, but I'd love, David, if, if we could maybe discuss this further uh, on the ready committee or even offline. Thank you. Paul. We we can do that, Kyle. And we have actually, the UW system with WEDC has put together a talent generator, which has about 100 screens of information for small employers on how to build a quality internship. And those kinds of uh, resources are available on our campuses. UW-Madison has a, a very extensive website on micro internships and other kinds of projects. And that's true all over the state. But I'm, what I'm hearing is we need to find better ways to get that information out to people. I think that's right. Regent Klein. Oh, thanks. I'm sorry. Um, just a quick question. Um, first of all, great presentation and very helpful. Um, exactly what we want to be doing. And uh, but I'm wondering, for instance, um, our freshwater wa uh, freshwater collaborative, uh, where we're trying to develop uh, learning opportunities, degree programs in the freshwater sciences. Um, as we develop new and possibly new curriculum is the business community weighing in you know how to, uh, you know uh, ideally i mean i hear greater connection of, with what we have but how how do we take into account things that um you know we should be developing uh, another example i would give would be solar 
um, is it, how, how do we get that information early so that we can um, adapt programming? It'd be a perfect transition, Regent Klein, to talk with our chancellors quickly about what are they doing as they're fostering new programs, freshwater science happening in a number of campuses, virtually all of them. I'd invite any chancellors to come forward if they wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, just kind of, and well, if you bring your video up, that'd be great. This is Dennis uh, Shields at Plantville. Good morning, Dennis. Go ahead. One of the core things that we've done is we developed a corporate relations function. We, we really appreciate that business and industry oftentimes doesn't know how to connect up with the appropriate people on our campus. So even at times a tight budget, we've made the investment of staffing up. I think there are three people in our corporate relations function. So any business that touches base with us, they don't have to figure out where to go to get what they want. Um, it, it is the corporate relations job. So if they want to know something about the Dairy Innovation Hub, or if they want to uh, connect up with our engineering programs or anything like that, we can, we can direct them to that. We also can enhance their experience by, you know, they come, well, we want to do your career fair, where we give them a menu of other ways that they can interact with our students that will help them attract the talent they need. I will stop there because I can talk about this for 30 minutes, but this is a very focused effort we've made to be more useful to business and industry. And I would say we have done the same thing at Superior. We have something that we have called the Link Center because it represents the link between the university and our community. And we're very engaged with our local uh, economic development engines up here in the north. Uh, we also do much the same thing with Dennis. We have a menu of things that we provide, but we also do a lot of listening as well. We call together roundtables of employers and uh, of our business community. We, we've got an initiative going to do a lot more definition to help our local small businesses develop internships. Uh, so it's really pretty extensive and it does provide that one-stop shop, that easy in. Everybody knows that the Link Center is where to go to help get connected to us. So. Uh, we're doing our very best to make sure that we are connected. Thank you, Renee. I'm going to turn to uh, Chancellor Mone, and then I'm going to turn to Chancellor Levitt. So I'll try and keep this as orderly as we can, given the virtual size of things. So, Mark, go ahead. Good Thank morning. you. Thank you, Regent Peterson. Good morning, uh, President Peterson, President Thompson, Board of Regent members. Um, to re be responsive to uh, Regent Klein's question, the Freshwater Collaborative is working statewide on exactly that. Uh, one of the mechanisms, for example, is the Water Council um, that has uh, almost uh, 20 members uh, with operations in a lot of different areas, but that's being replicated in communities across the state to make sure we align uh, with manufacturers, with municipalities, health departments, and others. Uh, for those, as you know, uh, water careers are growing dramatically. At UW-Milwaukee, beyond that, um, we're really stressing not just time to graduation, we're replacing that with, think about time to paycheck. I mean, that's really what's so important to students and parents today. And I think that's the thesis of this particular presentation this morning. And you know the needs of the state pre-pandemic for the last decade, that's what CEOs have absolutely been saying. We need more talent and we need it aligned with those areas. I'm really happy to report that at UWM, over 80% of over 5,000 of our graduates, very diverse graduates, stay in, the de stay in this state for um, at least a decade after work, 83% or more. And then 80% of those students fill the fastest growing, highest need uh, demands. We're in the process today of rebuilding our entire curriculum around experiential exercises and internships to really address what Regent Weatherly was talking about, which is the quality of the internships. Um, I was responsible for that in the business school for many years. And uh, we did have a screening process and look at it this way. Employers who don't put the best experiences in front of students are not going to be the ones that are going to get the top students and, and they're, not, they're going to develop a reputation. So it's definitely in the employer's best interest to put the greatest experience together and smart employers really figure that out. Uh, and especially in a hungry competitive environment, it's in their best interest to give students rich, meaningful experiences. So thank you for this opportunity. Mark, you're right. Hi, success uh, begets success. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Chancellor Levitt, and then we'll go to Chancellor Ford and Schmidt before we wrap up. 
Uh, thank you very much. And just two very quick points. Uh, when uh, UW Green Bay and UW Oshkosh work together to create the suite of engineering technology degrees that we offer in this region, we worked very closely with industry. As a matter of fact, they were the ones who informed us on, on the kinds of programs that we should be offering. And to this day, that those advisory groups still exist. So we very much got the kind of input we needed uh, from the people who would eventually be hiring those graduates uh, so that they, they we un understood what it is that they needed. Um, I would also say on the internship front, uh, I have no doubt that there are aberrations out there where people don't have the best possible experience. But uh, I think all of us, is, uh, I can probably speak for everybody, every UW in that we spend a lot of time and effort in terms of the amount of, of coaching and mentoring uh, and uh, oversight of in, in the uh, the internship experience that our students have. Our College of Business, uh, for instance, requires an internship for commencement. And we have uh, people on staff who do not, nothing else but go out and recruit those internships, prepare the students, and also monitor the situations the students are in. So this is a very closely monitored uh, situation, though I have no doubt that there are times when it just doesn't work out. But for the most part, we think it works out very well. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Good morning. Chancellor Ford. And Thank you, Regent Peterson. Uh, thank you to our panelists. And of course, thank you to Jenny Trick, our partner at Racine County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, appreciate the shout out uh, for, for our team here at UW Parks Out. And you represent all that UW Parks Out embodies as a UW Parks Out graduate. Um, I have, I guess, three points. First, um, I was really appreciate how our panelists talked about the importance of starting earlier. This, uh, these partnerships need to focus on keeping more Wisconsinites in our state and through our admissions process. And I know we're looking at um, opportunities to work with high schools through the UW system through to employment. And uh, the Higher Ed Regional Alliance is key uh, in working on that across um, the southeast part of our state. Uh, second, uh, we have been partnering with the Center for Workforce, I gotta get the right title, for the Center for Research on College Workforce Transitions at the UW, at UW Madison. Uh, we have conducted two different studies with them about the effectiveness of internships for our students. And it includes both um, conversations with employers as well as students who uh, participate in internships and those that choose to not. And we are using that research to really enhance uh, the effectiveness and uh, make internship opportunities more available across our full curriculum, like many of our uh, colleagues have talked about. Um, and then I also just want to um, echo the importance of continuing these conversations and how we as a system can really build the infrastructure that can support particularly our small and mid-sized businesses. Um, what Jenny said is that they are very, very busy. They don't know how to engage with our campuses. And if we can build um, some frameworks and templates. I know that will go a long way. So uh, thanks again. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, we'll go to Chancellor Jim Schmidt. Jim. Hey, good morning, welcome. everyone. So the internship market has gotten really hot lately. Um, in order for companies to be able to get the best interns from our campuses, they actually start recruiting as early as the freshman year. More and more of our students between their freshman and sophomore year are having their first internship. Well, almost 70% of our graduates from this past year had at least one internship. Keep in mind that was during COVID. And think about all of those internships that were canceled late spring and into the summer, but still 68% had at least one. 32% had more than one. And we're frankly seeing students leave the institution with as many as three. One piece I wanted to bring to your attention is the idea that these internships must be properly structured. Um, we make it very clear to our businesses that you are competing for them. And if you don't give them a great experience, the word will get back to campus to avoid company A. So let us help you. Let us coach you on how to develop a meaningful internship. We're partnering with Momentum, uh, Momentum West, and they've done a presentation to the Ready Committee um, in the past couple of years. And they've done a partnership between UW-Eau Claire, UW-Stout, and UW-River Falls. So we work together. They have an online system that as a business, you go immediately to it, you answer a series of questions about the internship that you um, would like to make available. And then one of our staff contacts them to work out the details to make sure it started. So I think we're seeing technology play a role to make it much more accessible. And again, each of our three institutions has a one-stop shop to make sure 
that businesses find a seamless way to interact with universities. Jim, can I just ask a quick follow-up? Given all the work that you've done on the, in this area, what are you doing? How are you accelerating freshmen and sophomores' experience on the internship side, right? It's always been upperclassmen get it, but I know you've been focused on doing it earlier. Talk a little bit about that. It starts when they visit campus. So I, I make it a point, uh, certainly during non-COVID, to welcome uh, prospective students in their sophomore, junior, and senior year. And I, I talk about the importance of high-impact experiences. We only measure three high impact experience. I mean, we measure others, but what we hold ourselves accountable is that students either have an internship, an undergraduate research experience, or study abroad. And frankly, more and more doing all three. And so I tell the students and then I, uh, as their prospects and then during orientation with their parents sitting with them, I said, now is the time to start thinking about an internship as early as the summer between your freshman and sophomore year. That's in addition to all of our programs that otherwise require those internships. Um, American Family Insurance, and again, I get out to a lot of businesses, they have one of the best internship programs I've ever seen because they want to get students as early as that first summer that they're here. And then there's an intense competition to see who's going to be invited back next year for that laddering uh, process where they continue to move towards employment. Uh, internships, our career fairs are really focused more on internships and hiring. Because frankly, if you don't hire a blue gold almost a year before they graduate, you're going to be waiting in line looking for grads. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Schmidt. You know, I know we could talk this uh, throughout the course of the day. Um, it, we've had a, a number of good connections and I think highlights of what we're doing in our regions. This is going on across the state with all of our campuses. But I know that we can do more. I know that our, our private sector partners are interested in us doing more. And I'm hopeful that by these kinds of conversations, we're going to generate more and more of these kind of discourses. They do have an appropriate place to go through the ready committee. But I also think it's nice when we can put the full board together to kind of have this kind of a conversation. At this point in time, I really want to thank David Bruchart for moderating and assembling our panel today. And to Becky, to Ashley, McGavi, and Jenny. Thank you so much for taking time out of your days to be with us. It's been very, very informative and we appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we look forward to partnering with you in the future. Thank you. Very good. We'll make sure that we share everyone's contact information. And I know David will handle that as we move through the course of the week. At this point in time, we're going to turn our attention to our annual presentation of the UW system's federal priorities. There are several key issues that we anticipate could impact the system in the coming year, and that includes the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, student financial aid, the reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act, resources for research and development, fostering talent and diversity. Here to present an overview of the UW System's federal agenda for 2021 is Mrs. Allison Steyer, whom I'm pleased to introduce to the board. Allison joined the UW System last fall as our new Director of Federal Relations. She will lead our advocacy and engagement efforts in Washington, D.C. Allison, who is a Janesville native, brings tremendous congressional experience to UW, having spent more than a decade working for Speaker Paul Ryan. She's also worked in government relations for Wisconsin's own Harley Davidson. I had the chance to work with Allison when she was in the speaker's office, and I'm very excited to have her on our government relations team now at the UW system. Good morning, Allison. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Regent President Pearson, for that introduction. It's great to be here today. I appreciate you, President Thompson and the board, allowing me a few minutes to introduce our 2021 federal priorities. As we thought about how to craft this document for a world that remains socially distant and where work remains remote, we took the opportunity to streamline the document. By focusing on our top priorities, providing appropriate data updates and targeted asks, the document is both easier to navigate and serves as the basis for what we hope are ongoing conversations between the system and our federal partners. While I do not want to read the document which has been shared, I will point to a few highlights. COVID-19 continues to have an immense impact on our institutions, students, faculty, and staff. And as we look toward a fall semester with a goal of at least 75% of all classes being in person, we will continue to need additional federal support. We remain grateful for the funding and funding flexibility we have received to this point, 
though we are likely to need additional funding to maintain and expand our ongoing testing, contact tracing, and virus mitigation efforts across our campuses. As has been the focus of the board, the impact of financial aid on the ability of students to attend our institutions cannot be overstated. Between 2019 and 2020, over two thirds of UW system undergraduates or about 97,000 students received some form of financial aid. Recognizing this impact, we will continue to advocate for programs that increase access and affordability, which is also a priority of the Biden administration. With more than $1 billion of sponsored research activity annually across our 13 institutions, the University of Wisconsin system remains a major source of research and innovation that extends within and beyond the borders of our state. We will continue to share with legislators the good work and research that is being done and where and when appropriate, explain that increased funding for basic and applied research is also of critical importance. With immigration the central focus of the current administration, we will hope to engage with our federal partners on issues that affect the ability of our students and faculties, faculty to study and work right here in Wisconsin. At our institutions, we will continue to support policies that attract the brightest international students, faculty, and researchers and make them feel welcome on our campuses and within our communities. Finally, we will look to engage with lawmakers on efforts to reauthorize the Higher Education Act, and we hope to serve as a resource for the committees and lawmakers as they examine the various proposals in front of them. If we've learned anything during the pandemic, it is that the unexpected issue will come up and we will work to assess and appropriately address that issue as needed. But hopefully these initial priorities allow us to position ourselves in each of our universities for su continued success. With that, I will conclude by noting that with new members in our delegation and members on committees of central importance, including House and Senate appropriations, House Education and Labor, and the Senate Health Committee, we have an opportunity to be engaged in key ways that we may not have been in the past. I look forward to this opportunity, and in fact, we'll be reaching out to the delegation for meetings on these very priorities tomorrow. If there are questions or concerns, I'm happy to address them. All right, thank you, Allison. I'll queue up questions. I, I, I was going to ask you, and I think it's separate and apart from the conversations you're about to have. Tell us just a little bit about how it is uh, advocating for the system given the COVID times. How is it working with offices? Are you doing video discussions? Are you doing phone calls? I know it's a very different time. Just give us some perspective on that. You're completely correct. It is a very different time, certainly from my experience where many of the folks on this board came in to meet with me in person. I have unfortunately not had the opportunity to do that um, with our current delegation. However, I've connected with each uh, delegation office either by a video chat or over the phone, oftentimes in both ways. I think that you know it certainly presents challenges in you know fostering and creating relationships. I'm fortunate to know um, many of the offices at this point, which has helped. But I will say I think one of the benefits of you know, kind of this current situation is that it allows members to really have more time in their days. You're able to schedule, um, you know, meetings back to back and pop into video chats more easily than you might have, um, you know, when you're going to in-person meetings. So in some ways it has allowed potentially for uh, better, con better conversations, more thorough conversations and increased touch points. Um, but that said, I think we all look forward to a day where we're back meeting in person where we're able to invite members and staff to campus to see the great work that we're doing. And I know as a former staffer myself, you can't undersell what seeing what is happening on campuses, the research that's being done in person um, is just crucially important. So we look forward to being able to do that, hopefully in the not too distant future. Perfect, thank you. Question from Regents for Allison. with you. What? Oh, Regent Becto, we'll start with you, I'm sorry. Okay, thanks Regent Peterson. Um, hey Allison, thank you for the report. Uh, one of the items you've been indicated is research funding and awards um, and trying to grow uh, the number of research grants. We've got our two um, research institutions which are leading the way in this area. I'm just curious if you could give us a little more detail on what are the priorities, where do you see the most significant opportunities? And going back to Regent Klein's question earlier, does the water consortium, does that present some, some further opportunities for us? Thank you, Regent Bechtel, it's a great question. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for us on this front. And in fact, 
Um, since starting at the system, I've engaged monthly with our research directors, which has really helped me to understand uh, the work that's being done on each of our campuses and how to best highlight that. So that is a conversation that continues. Um, I think the opportunities are great right now with the current administration. Um, we are out of the time of sequestration and um, budget caps, which is a bit technical, but it allows for uh, increased funding in, in priority areas. And so I think we will see increases um, in NIH and the Science Foundations, which are of incredible importance to all of our campuses, not just UW-Madison and UW-Milwaukee. Um, and so I think that we will be able to advocate and plan to with each member of our delegation, you know, increases in those areas and try to find projects that are happening in their districts that matter, you know, in the campuses that they serve um, to try and highlight additional areas for increased funding. Um, you know, I think that the Freshwater Collaborative is something that I remember folks coming to talk to me about when I was a staffer. And so I think um, between my colleagues who are on the state side and myself, we are working on ways to highlight that program and how to both fund it, make sure it's funded on the state level, but how to highlight it on the federal level as well. I think it's something that interests members across the delegation and across party lines. So we're excited to have those conversations. Yeah, and I appreciate that last comment. If we can do anything at the Water Council or through Chancellor Mone, I mean, let's just maybe we build a coalition of interested business and parties to kind of round out what you're doing and create more advocates for, for that, those programs. Thank you. Absolutely. I think that's completely correct and um, a process that we're engaged in both state and federally of how to um, create unique partnerships within the business community to the last panel as well of um, how to highlight the work that's happening. So love to partner with folks. Thank you, Regent Bechtel. Other questions from board members? Okay, seeing none, uh, Allison, thank you so much for the presentation. We'll look forward to continued uh, updates and anything that you need from us and the senior team we'll, we'll put forward. Great. Thank you, President Peterson. Thanks for being here. So next, I'm going to call on Lauren Heller, Vice Chancellor for Finance Administration at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, to provide an overview of a proposed contractual agreement uh, with Emmis Corp. Uh, Lauren, are you with us? Indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Regent, Peter, uh, Regent President Peterson and members of the board. Uh, thank you for considering this contract today. Uh, before you is an agreement uh, between the School of Medicine and Public Health and the Fundus uh, Photograph Research Center at UW-Madison and EMIS. Uh, EMIS is a clinical uh, contract research organization uh, that works with companies uh, looking to place uh, studies. Um, uh, we've done several studies with them in the past. This one is with uh, Verily Life Sciences, uh, which um, is uh, owned by Alphabet, the parent company of Google. Uh, this particular study is very interesting. Um, it is a uh, clinical validation study protocol. Uh, it's going to evaluate the accuracy of artificial intelligence software. This is uh, Google's DeepMind project. Uh, in detecting diabetic retinopathy uh, using like a handheld camera and screening uh, people's retinas. Uh, as you'll recall from previous business with the Fundus Research Center, that's their specialty. Uh, they assist people doing cl clinical trials to do this sort of work uh, and provide software and services uh, for storing those images and analyzing them uh, to tell how effective drugs and treatments are uh, for these various macular diseases. Uh, this one will actually have uh, Fundus doing the reading and, you know, and they're really sort of the gold standard in the country on doing this work. And they'll be reading the scans and uh, comparing it uh, to Verily Life Sciences, Google DeepMind artificial intelligence read on those same uh, images in order to tell if this AI technology uh, is able to um, uh, serve an important clinical purpose. So it's a three-year agreement about $1.4 million dollars. Uh, pretty straightforward, other than the uh, super interesting subject matter. Um, so I'll pause there. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Heller. Uh, before we have a discussion, I'll, I'll seek a motion to approve Resolution 10. Regents may have a motion. So moved, Regent Walsh. Second, Stanford Taylor. Thank you, Regents. We have a motion. We have a second. Uh, any discussion for Vice Chancellor Heller on the contract? Okay, seeing none, uh, 
I'll just note, Lauren, you're very nomadic. Each and every time we see you, you're in a different room. I appreciate you being here this, <laughs> this afternoon. With that, uh, we'll call the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Heller. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to item 11. I call on Regent Olivia Woodmancy to present a proposal to establish a new set of region awards to recognize exceptional service among the UW Systems University staff. Regent Woodmancy. Thank you, President Peterson. I am so incredibly excited to announce the creation of this new award. As you all know, every single day there are thousands of people who work tirelessly to support our state, our institutions, and most importantly, our students. The board currently has three awards that recognize the outstanding work that takes place. The Academic Staff Excellence Awards, our Teaching Excellence Awards, and the Regents Diversity Awards. Here we can see that there's a gap in our recognition, our university staff members. These individuals are vital to our institutions and their continued efforts must be recognized. Thus, we are proposing to implement the University Staff Excellence Awards. These awards would recognize individuals and programs for their, their outstanding contributions. As you can see, it is our hope to implement this award as soon as possible, with the first awards being recognized at the October board meeting. The quick, this quick implementation process would not be possible without the work of some fantastic individuals. I want to thank Carlene Van Dizand and her incredible team, Jess and Megan, Sean, and Regent Walsh, for all their efforts in the creation of this award. Being on a campus every single day, I can speak firsthand at how tirelessly our university staff have worked during this pandemic. Our institutions would not be open right now without the dedicated time and energy of these individuals. I hope that you can join me in supporting this award. With that, I move to approve Resolution 11, establishing three university staff awards to be given annually. Thank you, Regent Woodman. See, we have a motion on the table. May I have a second? Second. Second, second. second Regent Greeby. Um, discussion for Regent Woodman. See. President uh, Peterson. Yes, Regent Walsh. I can't see yes. you yet, but I. Okay, I'm here. Go ahead. Okay, um, so uh, in discussions about this award, um, it, it really became apparent during the pandemic, um, if it wasn't before, the crucial importance of the people in these jobs and uh, the fact that many of them had to come into their jobs when perhaps they would have liked to have uh, worked from home and did not have that option. Um, there's an incredible number of dedicated people uh, in the staff uh, of every single school in our system. And it's, it's really, um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to support this effort um, and idea that originated with Regent Woodmansey. Thank you, Regent Walsh. Other comments from board members or questions? I have a Regent Manny Go ahead. Thank you, Regent President Peterson. You know, this is really important, and I'm glad that this has been brought up by Olivia. When I was in college, I was uh, had a work-study job where I worked with a janitor at the gym. And, uh, you know, that sounds like that wouldn't be much, but uh, actually uh, he taught me some things that I really needed to hear. And, uh, you know, such as looking your best when you go to the job, making sure your shoes are shined, tucking in your shirt, comb, making sure your hair was combed. Back then it was like really long, but... Uh, you know, those things were reinforced through this gentleman. Uh, the work ethic that he had uh, was a, an example to me. And not only that, but he took the time to, to ask me about myself and help me through some hard times when I was uh, going, you know, in college, which we all face. But, you know, we, they, they, take, uh, they take care of students in addition to, to doing all that they do. So uh, it's about time that they are recognized. And, and I thank Olivia for doing this. Thank you, Regent Manny Deeds, for your comments. Regent Regent Hall, Dr. Hall. Yeah, I just I just wanted to get out because so often there are certain individuals that we forget about and just take for granted. So, you know, just as a regent and as a system, I also just support and appreciate um, Olivia, Regent Olivia's thoughts. Um, about this kind of recognition. So that's it. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Mm -hmm. 
Any other comments from Regents? We have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Before we move on, I'd like to personally thank Regent Woodman C for taking the initiative to establish this new Regent Award honoring the exceptional service of our university staff employees. At last count, there are more than 8,300 across the system. This is yet another example of Olivia's persistence, hard work, and dedication to the University of Wisconsin system. Olivia has worked tirelessly to advance the issues of importance to students, faculty, staff, and our universities. Most often, she works quietly and thoughtfully behind the scenes with curiosity and determination in service to students, UW employees, and her colleagues on the board. She's also tenacious. She asks tough questions. She speaks out about injustice. As a member of this board, I've had the pleasure to serve with many remarkable colleagues and great leaders. Regent Olivia Woodmancy is without question among the best of the best. Olivia, Regent Woodmancy, as you near the end of your term on this board, I want to publicly acknowledge and thank you for your service and commitment to the University of Wisconsin system and to the Board of Regents. I'm proud to call Olivia a colleague and a friend, and we all look forward to following her career after she graduates this spring. Thank you. Before we conclude the open session portion of our meeting, do any regents have communications, petitions, or memorials to share? President Thompson. <clears throat> yes, it's uh, really a delight for me to uh, share great news from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Uh, Chancellor Michael Alexander, who is uh, a relatively new chancellor, has done an exceptional job at the university. University of Wisconsin Green Bay, ladies and gentlemen, is the first university of the UW system to receive the first generation forward designation from the Center for First Generation Student Success. The first gen forward designation recognizes institutions of higher education, which have demonstrated a commitment to improving experiences and advancing the outcomes of first generation college students. UW Green Bay is one of only 80 institutions nationwide to earn this designation. At UW Green Bay, 34% of undergraduates and 11% of graduate students are recognized as first generation. That is the first in their families to pursue a college degree. I am very proud and I think the board should be very proud and offer congratulations to the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, their outstanding chancellor, Mike Alexander, as well as Corey King, the vice chancellor for inclusivity in student affairs, as well as Kate Burns, interim provost. Well done. And back to you, President Peterson. Thank you, President Thompson. We're going to go a bit out of order. I'm going to go back to Regent Manny Deeds, who wanted to make some additional comments regarding Regent Woodmancy, and then I will move to Regent Walsh, who has a communication. So back to you, Ed. Appreciate that. Thank you, Regent President Peterson. You know, I've, I've been on this um, Regent gig for now my second time, and during that time, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting six student Regents, and all of them were outstanding, and all of them made significant contributions uh, to the board. However, Olivia, uh, in addition to doing all that she uh, is asked to do, and that we all do, by, by way of being on committees and chairing the student Appeals Committee and being on the Regent Diversity Awards Committee and doing all that she does comes up with different things to help us uh, do our jobs better, such as with the Regent Diversity Award Committee uh, saying that instead of just recognizing the, the entity or person that wins that award, that we should recognize everyone that was in the running for that award, which made a lot of sense, but we hadn't thought about it until she uh, mentioned it. And so we adopted that as being a good idea. Uh, such as the uh, award for the outstanding uh, university staff 
employee. Excellent idea, hadn't been thought about before. So you ask yourself, how is this happening? It's because uh, when I first met Olivia, it was at our Senate uh, confirmation hearing and she uh, gave uh, just a marvelous speech and reasons why she was looking forward to serving the state and the students uh, of the system. And make no make mistake about it, Olivia has a special interest in, in doing what's in the best interest of the students of the University of Wisconsin system. Uh, she always argues for what would be in their best interest. She always is there for them during uh, discussions such as the Student Appeals Committee. Uh, she always fights for the student and uh, students should know that. Students should also know that, know that no matter what pressure is applied by way of argument or other means, she always speaks the truth. And that requires courage, it requires strength, and it requires conviction. And she has all of those qualities in addition to everything else that she brings to the table. You know, Olivia, when I met you, I told you you had a gift and you had to share it with us, remember that? Well, you have, I appreciate it, we all do, and we're all very proud of you, so thank you. Thank you, Regent Manny Deeds. I couldn't agree with you more. Our future is bright with leaders like Olivia. Regent Walsh. Thank you, Regent President Peterson. I'd, I'd like to share a communication from the Dean of the Veterinary School at Madison. The UW School of Veterinary Medicine was sad to learn that one of our faculty took his life last Tuesday. Dr. Josh Smith was a beloved clinician in our emergency medicine department and very much respected by our students staff, fellow clinicians, house officers, and most importantly, our clients and their animals. Suicide in our profession is much too pervasive and we are dedicated to pursuing all avenues to support our faculty, staff, and students' mental health and wellness to overcome the issues that some unfortunately succumb to. Please join us in supporting Dr. Smith's family and friends in any way that you can during this very difficult time. Uh, it, I'd like to just briefly add to Dean Markell's words. I have been associated with the vet school for a number of years now as a member of their board of visitors. And I find that people are very shocked when they hear the prevalence of suicide in the veterinary profession. Uh, if you go by occupation, police officers are number one at the most risk. Number two is actually veterinarians. They come to their jobs with huge debts. They often experience compassion fatigue. Sometimes it happens quite early in their career. Um, I want to assure the region that the school has many resources available to students. Um, also bringing up the subject of taking care of mental health and taking care of their stress level as they progress through veterinary school. Um, if you want to know more about uh, the prevalence of suicide and the issues in the veterinary profession, I would encourage you to look at a TED talk uh, by Dr. Melanie Bowden, B-O-W-E-N. Um, and if you know a veterinarian, if you have a veterinarian, be kind to them. They have suffered so during the pandemic. So thank you for the opportunity to share that. Thank you, Regent Walsh. At this time, I'll ask all board members to stay on the line while we complete the roll call to move into closed session. Following the vote, please remain in the meeting while Jess clears the line. At this time, Vice President Greeby, will you read the motion to move us into closed session, please? I move that the Board of Regents move into closed session to A, consider strategies for crime detection and prevention as permitted under Section 1985 1D of the Wisconsin Statutes, B, confer with legal counsel regarding potential litigation in which it is likely to become involved regarding a contract as permitted by section 1985 1G of the Wisconsin statutes and C consider personnel evaluations of chancellors as permitted by section 1985 1C of the Wisconsin statutes. So move into closed session. Can I have a second, please? Second, Mike Jones. Thank you, Regent Jones. This time, Madam Chair, we, or we, Clerk, will you please call the roll? Regent President Peterson. Yes. Regent Vice President Grebe. Yes. Regent Atwell. Yes. Regent Bechtel. Yes. Regent Bogus. Yes. Regent Cologne. Yes. Regent Hall. Yes. 
Regent Jones? Yes. Regent Klein? Yes. Regent Levzo? Yes. Regent Many Deeds? Yes. Regent Miller? Yes. Regent Peterson? Yes. Regent Sappold? Yes. Regent Stanford Taylor? Yes. Regent Walsh? Yes. Regent Weatherly? Yes. Regent Woodmansey? Yes. We are now in closed session. One moment, please.